Yeah, yeah. I said. Yeah. yeah. L- let's start with this. I fully, fully, 100,000% with no hedge do not believe that you can teach entrepreneurship, right? So that's awkward. You know, uh, you know. <laughs> What I, mean, what I mean by that is that, you know, it's crazy for me that that word is now considered like cool and good. Like when I was your age 20 years ago, entrepreneur meant that you were a fucking loser that was figuring it out, right? So watching, watching what's happening to the world right now where this has become a hot topic is interesting to me and like I, I'm super pumped that people now value that in a different way than they did the way, I mean, I, I grew up a DNF student, right? And, and the reason I grew up a DNF student was I was unable to sit in a room like this and listen to whoever was sitting up here because all I wanted to do was sell shit, right? And so that's all I've ever known. I've had no other gear. Somewhere around fourth grade when I got an F on a science test, I literally like that day was like, yeah, that makes sense to me because I don't give a fuck about Saturn, right? <laughs> like, like, like I don't, that's not who I am. And so I think, I think if there was anything I could do, if there was anything I could do that would be awesome for you guys it, to make the most money I could make, I would create a test or, or a drug that allowed people to become self-aware. I think the number one thing that I could tell you, because I'm desperate to bring value since I'm here, is I think everybody lies to themselves. And I think all of you want certain things to be happening with you. You want yourself to be something. And I think what you need to do more of, and if I can give you, uh, clearly I'm coming out the gate with my best piece of advice. I I really do think uh, you you have to audit who you actually are. I think that America as a, a society has done a really good job in selling us how to fix the things that we naturally aren't. And there's a lot of money being made on us forming into something we can't be. And I, either through massive ego and bravado, complete ignorance, I don't know what it was early on in my life, maybe the the outrageous level of self-esteem that my mom instilled in me, I was able to quickly, very, very early on, and and let me take it back, because a lot of you don't know, I was born in Belarus in the former Soviet Union. And so I came here when I was three, and we were super poor, you know, I lived in a studio apartment. I know what it tastes like to walk five miles to Kmart, buy toilet paper, come home, and then sit there for an hour and split the toilet paper to get efficiency. That's a huge advantage for me, right? Like, the fact that I've been working 19 hours a day, every day for the last 20 years is easy for me. It's the only gear I knew, right? I was poor. I sucked shit at school. It was the only gear I had, right? So like I sit here with enormous disrespect and with enormous assumptions around all of you that you're just too soft to beat me, right? That I think that you've had it better and that that alone doesn't allow you to beat me. And that's how I I think of entrepreneurship in a very rugged, very raw, much dirtier way. I've been investing for about seven years. The first three things I invested in in 2007, after I built my wine business and I realized this internet thing was gonna be big, right, was, was Facebook, Twitter, and Tumblr, right? And then I've collectively gotten stupider since that moment, mainly because I didn't think of myself as an investor when I invested in those companies. I just thought that Ev Williams, Zucks, and David Karp were really fucking smart and were gonna win, right? And so like, when I think about Uber, like, Travis is one of my best, best buddies, like, now he has a lot of press and I'm sure a lot of you know who he is. That just makes a lot of sense because all the negative press he gets makes sense because he's a fighter. But he was the only CEO of that company because Uber's had to fight City Hall for the last four years. It's hard to fight the mafia that owns the taxi service in Vegas. That takes, like I can't do that. Like I'm too not confrontational, right? So I think that the number one thing that you can do, the the you know, I'm desperately competitive and want to be the person that brings the most value to you out of all these talks. Like, I secretly sit here and say, oh, they're gonna get all these people that they've heard of, but I'm gonna be the one that tells them something that actually fucking matters. And that one thing is, you need to bet on your strengths and don't give a fuck about what you suck at. You're gonna, uh, way too many people in this room are gonna spend the next 30, 40 years of their lives trying to check the boxes of the things that they're not as good at and that you're gonna waste a fuckload of time and lose. I highly recommend auditing yourself or if you have no fucking empathy or 
EQ or self-awareness, then find somebody in your family or friendship that does and let them tell you who you are. And once you believe that, either for yourself or someone else told you, go directly all chips all into that because that is the only possible way, in my opinion, watching from the outside, that is, let me rephrase, that is a very highly likely way of over-indexing because the truth is, if you want to be an anomaly, you've got to act like one. You know, like, and so, that's it. That's what I got. So thanks for having me. <laughs> I, I think that, um, I think that, uh, I think that it's been really interesting for me for the last three years to watch, so tech, when I was investing in it for me and when I was growing my business in the 90s and then when I really got into it in 04, 05, 06, 07, um, you know, people were in it because they were really good at it or in it or really passionate. Right now, everybody thinks that if you're 22 and you have an idea, you're entitled to a startup, right? And so, the thing that's been really fascinating for me to watch, the dichotomy of structure and understanding how to play the game versus entrepreneurship. So for example, again, being a dick about it, I know I'm sitting in a room full of number twos, threes, and fours, right? There's so many people in this room that are like gonna be, like could be dominant number two, threes, and fours, and I'm pissed that the narrative now is that you need to be a number one and have your company because a lot of people are gonna lose or leave money on the table because that's just the narrative, right? And so the difference for me between a two, three, and four and a one is having a stomach. And so one of the things that we've seen a lot of because Zucks went to Harvard and like literally being East Coast bound, like watching all these kids that are going to Ivy League schools, including Stanford, so mixing the whole mix. Just like, actually everybody's a better student than I was, so I'll just call it everybody. But watching the elite top 3%, so many of those players, guys and gals, have come into the game in the last 24, 36 months and have lived a narrative where things have been good, right? Like, like you know, again, I'm using a lot of prejudice. I default into thinking that like you guys were way more capable than me than figuring out how to map yourselves to go through the school system, like you understood that game. Like very honestly, like it's cool to be like, oh fuck school and I sucked and then I was a great entrepreneur but like it would have been cool to have figured it out. Like I would have been fine getting C's and B's, right? Like that would have been interesting. Then that, you know, I, that, like then I would have had a better life. Like, it, like college would have been more fun. I wouldn't, went, wouldn't have went to Mount Ida College where seven of my eight core friends fucking went to jail, right? So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to keep it real. Uh, so, you know, so, but I just couldn't. And I think that that's what I'm seeing the reverse of right now, which is on the flip side, being an entrepreneur and really running a successful company, here's the problem. There isn't just like one teacher who fucking decides and you figured out how to map him or the syllabus or whatever the fuck you guys do to figure out what you needed. The problem is when you have a startup or a business, you're playing to the market. And the market doesn't give a fuck who your parents were or how you rolled or what happened before. The market just cares about the market. And so I think that what's been really interesting for me to observe and and I would say is something for you guys to think about is again, you're gonna wanna think in a certain way versus what may be the reality or you might underestimate yourself. It just depends on your DNA. But the ability to adjust is the entire game. Like I'm so proud that I, change my mind every day. My dad used to get so pissed when I was building Wine Library. He would always be like, fuck, he's like, he would say like, three months ago you said Ricky was gonna be the best employee. I'm like, I changed my mind, he's shit, fire him. Or, or <laughs> he's like, you said sparkling wine was important, now you just eliminated it from the key spot. I'm like, I changed my mind. Like, my ability to only be comfortable in massive chaos has been my biggest asset as an entrepreneur. Like, I would never take a fucking note. Like, that scares the piss out of me what these three people are doing right now, right? And so, now, 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 that may work for them and I'm not, like, back to the opening statement, like, you need to do you. Like, some, plenty of people that make a fuckload more money than me and one bigger take fucking notes. The key, the key though, the key is way too many people are doing, like, Here's a good one. You know what really pissed me the fuck off? (laughs) I'm completely driven by like happiness and like I'm crippled by like chaos. Like, you know, VaynerMedia, which is now 500 people, update your shit. Um, (laughs) 
VaynerMedia is like completely dictated by, like I'm a dictator of HR. Like all I care about is the atmosphere. All I care about is how people, intern. All I care about is like how people roll. Like I, I think I fired the four most talented, smartest people that have worked for me because if you don't know how to play with the other boys and girls, you're out because I suffocate under, you know, conflict and negativity and like nobody's better than me so you, you gotta go. So what really pissed me off in tech world was when S- Steve Jobs' book came out when he was dying, when it was all about Steve three or four years ago. I literally watched a lot of my tech startup friends start being like a dick to their staff because Jobs was tough. Everybody fell into the romance of like I have this big vision and I'm gonna be a dick like Steve, right? And I thought that was really interesting for me to watch that half decade of like literally watching people I know and then watching them act differently because the status or the icon of the moment and you see a lot of that. And so like that is probably the energy I'm trying to bring to this class today which is you can look at like how people roll and like it's great to admire and things of that nature but it's so damn important to stick to like your DNA, right? And like what you're good at and to recognize that you need to surround yourself, whether it's your co-founder or whether it's the people that work for you. Like all I do is hire the people that are the opposite of me, that bring the other value, that bring me the ability to remember what the fuck that meeting was about and go make sure it happens. You know, like whatever it may be, right? And so I think that's another thing that I would highly (laughs) recognize. I think the other thing you guys should recognize is how ridiculously lucky you are, but how interesting the supply and demand of your luck is changing. Meaning, it's never been better to be an entrepreneur. Like right now, Right this second is the greatest. There's massive disruption. I promise you, because I spend a fuckload of time with everybody in corporate America, the big companies are so fucking slow and stupid, it's almost unbearable, right? So that's great for us if we don't have money and we've got time, right? And so that's great. And, and the cost of entry is easy. There's so many people that are envious of the lucky things that happened to me investing in like Uber and Birchbox and Twitter and all those things that now everybody in their 30s to 60s that has any level of money is chasing any kid in a hoodie with an idea and giving them money to invest in their startup because everybody's looking for their exit, right? So on top of the fact that the internet is hitting maturity and every user's on a smartphone and blah, blah, blah and we're at scale, on top of that, in parallel, there's a fuckload of dumb money chasing it and looking at, to give it to anybody they can which is your opportunity. So we need to take advantage of that horse shit. And actually, if you think you're ready, you should literally start your company right now because I'm sure it's important to finish this class and whatever, but tomorrow the market can collapse and you'll miss this opportunity. Literally right now, on a fucking half-ass idea, right, with like two or three connections from like your parents or professors or emailing me and I interview you somebody, you can literally raise a million dollars on your horse shit idea. <laughs> But we need to like, quanti- like, I want everybody to understand that. All it takes is something crazy, like a terrorist attack or some fucking bank full of shit breaking or all it, like tomorrow, that can go away. And so like, I think it's super important for everybody to understand that if you're itching, I think you should start tomorrow because the money's there and you're gonna need the money because this happens all the time. Like, everybody that looked like you in 2008 and 9, they went and got jobs. Everybody looked like you in 2002 and 3 after the first bubble, they went and got jobs. So if you're a true entrepreneur, if you're sitting here like, no, I'm entrepreneur, I'm not just in the class, you need to seriously concentrate on where we are at this exact moment in the market and recognize how fruitful it is for you, how much of an advantage you have, and you may want to seriously consider and take advantage of it because it could really go away in a second and then you've got to wait a, like, if it collapses tomorrow, if there's a bubble burst, you're gonna have to wait three to five years to get your shot. When bubbles burst, no fucking kid with an idea gets dick. Got it? That's a good one. Um, I like that one. But that's what happens. So, so I think that's important. Timing's massively important. Um, and so that's why I'm pushing that agenda. Um, bless you. I think the other thing to, uh, I think the other thing to think about is, uh, I think that, here's just some random shit, and then maybe we can go into Q&A. I think that Uber, Airbnb, and Instacart are not anomalies the way a lot of people in my world think. I think they're just a preview. I think if everybody here understands that the number one asset to everybody in the world is time, and if you can figure out how to buy and sell it back, that's a big coup. So I think the biggest reason I got excited about Uber years ago was I realized, holy shit, 
This isn't about transportation. This is about a company that sells me back time. As a matter of fact, I actually boycotted LA for four years. I actually didn't come to LA for four years because I hated fucking coming here so much because I didn't want to rent a car and the fucking shit. I fucking hated this place. <laughs> Literally, I started, now I'm back all the time because Uber, because I can get around, right? Like I can actually move and so that was good. Um, <laughs> but back to the main point, it's stunning for me to watch people's behavior. Literally, fundamentally, we care about the health of our loved ones, money, and then time. And I think if you really look at what Uber's doing, it's selling back time. And I think if you're thinking in startup mode, if you're looking for an inspirational seed as a starting point, I highly recommend thinking about time. People will massively overpay for it. You love time so much you don't even realize that. Think about the last time your phone or, or your computer was a hundredth of a second slower than what you're used to on Wi-Fi, how fucking pissed you were. Like that's how much we like time. And so that is a big theme that I think is gonna play out. And so again, recognizing some, not everybody here has their full idea or everything you know, figured out, I think that's an important place to play. I think the other thing that's really important is I think I play the game a little bit backwards. So I publicly give away all my best ideas. All of them. I recognize as an individual, I'm not gonna be able to go and execute every great idea, every great thought I have. And so I've lived a life for the last seven years where I put out all my content at scale, whether through blog, I'm writing a lot on Medium right now, if you don't know what that is, you should check it out, it's really rad. Um, you know, stuff like that. And so I think early on in one's career, and definitely I watch a lot of people that don't understand what's happening now, is the value of your thoughts can be extreme. So I highly recommend Thinking about putting your thoughts out to the world in whatever way you communicate, whether through audio podcast or written form for medium or video blog. If you're thinking about entrepreneurship, if you're thinking about trends, if you're thinking about business, you're literally just one three minute read on a medium away from creating a huge gateway drug to a lot of opportunity. If your thought is deemed as smart or forward thinking or different by another thought leader or somebody's got an opportunity. And I'm surprised, I think this is very residual from the way it used to be in the world of patents and ideas. I love when, I lo- my, my, my assistant's got a great thing now in this. Once in every four months somebody sends an email saying, I've got a huge startup that I want you to invest in, but you've got to sign this NDA, right? Which literally every time gets an email back that says, fuck you, right? <laughs> and, and the reason is, I'm a humongous believer that ideas are shit and that execution's the game, right? We've all got ideas. Everybody's got ideas. Do you mean fucking ideas we all have here? We could probably sit here for the next two hours, draw them all out, record them, and predict the next 78 great startups over the next nine years. And? So I think the thing that is another theme in entrepreneurship is there is way too much fodder brought to the idea Uber was Magic Cab three years earlier. Uber is not an idea. Uber existed. It's called Magic Cab. But the guys that executed it sucked. So they lost. So I think, you know, if there's any level of romance left in this room about your idea, I'd like to suffocate it. Because I think the actual situation is what you actually do with it. And so that leads me to the last point. I'm, you know, Maybe it's because I was born in a communist country, maybe it's because I came from zero, but I really think that people who think they're entrepreneurs that don't work 15 to 17 hours a day aren't. I really believe that. I, I'm sure that's short-sighted and one-dimensional, but I just believe it with my entire soul. Like, it blows me away of watching the startups I'm investing in where they're like leaving half-day Friday during the summer to go to the Hamptons to like hook up. Like, it, you know, cool, I get it. And it's, I wish I could do it, but I think that uh, I think that there's a I think there's a pretty substantial soft mentality in the game right now, and, um, and what's deemed as hard work is uh, is probably not going to be deemed as hard work by your grandparents or great grandparents, and definitely the opportunity at hand when you're taking people's money. I mean, look, I I think one thing that should be talked about as well is. I would say 80% of the kids that I'm giving money to between 22 and 25, as you can tell, I'm not traditional and so we get nice relationships. I would say 80% of them tell me right to my face there's, that they actually have no worry whatsoever to lose my money. That it's awesome, right? Like, I'm sure you're thinking it too. Like, cool, I'll raise a million bucks, I'll learn a fuckload. If I lose, I'm still just 26. I got plenty of time. I'll take all that experience 
and I'll go apply it. Let me tell you one thing about that experience and applying it. One of the things that's very dangerous, if you think you're gonna be great, I highly recommend that you be very smart about how you go about this because the thing that most people don't talk about is the fact that that checkbox in the loss column eliminates you from a lot of opportunity the next go around. And so a lot of people right now, they're taking money and just starting shit because it's easy and, and who knows and it's like fucking roll it, right? What, what's happening is when you lose, all the people that are, you're gonna look for money, bless you, all the people you're gonna look for money in the future and the market and your fucking Wikipedia that say you fucking lost and all that shit, it's all there and so I think there's a lack of thinking about legacy and long-term marathon thinking right now in a sprinter's mentality where there is a lot of access to capital and everything feels shiny so I'd like to instill some level of giving a shit about 10 or 14 or 19 years out too. I'd like to do some Q&A if that's cool. Yeah man. What's your name? My name's Shane. Shane. Shay? Shane. Shane. Thanks for coming out. I like Shay better. Can we start our company tomorrow? Where do we protect our legacy? That's a great question. So I think you can start your, so perfect, thanks. I am a contradiction, so fuck you, Shane. Uh, I, think, I think you do both, and, he, and this is what I mean, right? Like there's a big difference between going to like 15 tech conferences, using all your leverage, getting to everybody that sat up here, saying you've got it, getting those checks versus you know, borrowing like 30 grand from a friend, rich friend or your parents or you know, there's a way to do both, right? And so um, I would do both. I mean if you, look, who, let's play this game and don't bullshit me because I might call on you and then expose you. How many people here really, really think they've got their idea and they're ready to go? I really think you should leave with all my fucking heart. Like leave right the fuck, like walk out of this room and go do it, right? So because I really believe that like tomorrow something bad can happen and it's really good for you guys right now. Like you could really get 200,000. Like you know this, right? Like, like, it's, like it's crazy the default that we think of how easy it is to get money. You know how hard it was to get money in 1998 when I came out of the game? Like you couldn't get 50 bucks from somebody, right? Like, like it's so fucking bonkers because Hollywood dictates thinking. Guys, Zuck's fucking movie fucked with people's heads and you're taking advantage of that. So I think that what happens is, and listen, this is me being a historian. I wasn't in the game for Web 1.0 bubble. I was in New Jersey building a wine store during Web 1.0 bubble, so I wasn't in those little Cosmo.com, Pet.com game. I was being practical with my $15,000 a year in marketing and building my business. I mean, all those guys and gals did the same thing. They fucking went out, they, they had the moment that you have right now, they fucking were worth a drillion on paper because everything went IPO back then, right? And then like April happened and everybody lost everything and they were all working for like Fox and like fucking the New York Times and like Condé Nest the next fucking day. <laughs> and so, you know, I, you know, one more time, who, who's got it? Who's got it right now? You need to really, really debate it. And like the only dynamic that I would even accept is like you love your parents so much and they're still so fucking old school that it would hurt their feelings. But other than that, there's literally no other excuse. Questions? Yes. Um, my name is June. Thank you so June? much for coming. Um, yes, June, like the month. Mm-hmm. So what did Zuck and all the other guys who came, like what did they do, right, that you knew they, they, they were the smart ones? Well, the things with, with Tumblr, Twitter, and Facebook, they had all already won. Like I love when people are like, he was such a forward thinker. I'm like, I'll take it, but fuck, they we were already winning, right? Like it was 2007, like Facebook was fucking huge, right? Like Twitter, I felt like, I just felt intuitive about Twitter, right? Like I just, coming from email marketing and like being a marketer and a salesman, I understood how building an audience and then that audience, like email marketing was like you blasted people and they did shit, but like, Forwarding emails to your entire address book, that died by like 99, right? And so, and so when Twitter came, thinking like I was gonna push something out and then people were like, oh, I'll pass that on. I was like, fuck, word of mouth, right? And like so, Twitter as a product spoke to me. It's why I've over-indexed on it. It's been my foundation. That was a little bit different. And then Ev, you know, who's, who I bet on more than Jack, it was more Ev. And my whole theory on that was, well, he built Blogger and sold it to Google, like he's already won once, right? And that was kind of a nice thing. It's fun to bet on somebody who's been able to see it through. Um, Tumblr was interesting. Tumblr, so 
I'm a straight creeper, right? Like, so on the way here today at JFK, I literally like got to my gate, looked around, found like four 13 year old girls, literally sat behind them and watched everything they did, right? <laughs> so by the way, real quick, if you ever hear that I go to jail, just know it was market research. <laughs> and I did that today, and what did I watch? I watched, I watched them spend 99% of their time on Instagram, Yik Yak, and Snapchat, right? And so that's what happened with me in Tumblr in 2007. Like, it was a little different then, it was laptops, phones are better, you look less creepy. Um, I just started getting a sense that junior high kids were on Tumblr way more than anybody was talking about it. That was a good one for me because I'm New York based, Carp was in New York. Carp is super artist, I'm super businessman, so there was a nice yin and yang. I knew how to, res- by that point I knew how to respect that fucking nerd shit and not scare them. And so, um, yeah, it just worked out, right? Like. Uh, it, uh, I mean, this is how insane 2009 was. I joined Tumblr and Tumblr on the dashboard put Gary V joins Tumblr on everybody's dashboard for a week. Like, it was just a different world. I got in their Series B at 14 million. They already had users. Now like somebody farts an idea and gets 14 million pre-product. So it was a different market. Um, Birchbox is probably the best one. Birchbox had 60 no's. Before. I wrote the first check. To, how many people are familiar with Birchbox? Cool, so Birchbox, if you don't know, you should check it out. It was two Harvard HBS girls. They got like 60 no's. I remember sitting in that meeting and investing on the spot and they were super pumped and they, then they told me they got 60 no's, which was probably a smart strategic move. And I remember just leaving that meeting thinking like that was just straight sexism, right? Like that was the only thing I could wrap my head around, like that people just didn't want to invest in the girls. This, like I couldn't understand, because the model was phenomenal. It's like, hey, here's our business model. We're gonna sell people makeup samples that we get for free, right? Like, and so like back to, the, the, back to my first business of ripping people's flowers, ringing their doorbell and selling, it felt like that. I'm like, this is a good model. No overhead. And then I remember telling them, I'm like, look, if we can do customer acquisition at scale and get enough leverage, eventually makeup brands are gonna pay you to be in there. And that's what's happened with that company. So that one was more them. They were so sharp. I, I, I literally have never, like, you know, I'm acutely aware of like racism. Like I got out of Russia by being Jewish, right? Like my parents were super persecuted in, in the Soviet Union, and so I've always been hypersensitive to it. But that one was the most extreme case because they crushed and knew what they were doing, and it's great to watch that go out and actually become such a big company. Um, but simple things like yik yak, right? I fucked up and didn't see it through, but which I'm pissed about. But the only reason I even reached out to them, um, just to give you an example, like messing up. Nine or 10 months ago, I could have gotten in at a $4 million valuation. They just raised at a $350 million valuation. And the only reason I got to that gateway is that every morning when I wake up and go take a crap, the first thing I do on my phone is look at the iTunes top 150 free apps and Yik Yak just started showing up. 150, 137, 123, 123. Like, what the fuck is this, right? And Secret and Whisper were getting all the Silicon Valley attention, yet they weren't even showing up on that and just knew normal kids were doing it. So same thing happened with Snapchat. I remember creeping on 13 year old girls for a couple months and being like, the fuck is that yellow thing on their, on their phone? Like it's always showing up. That was good because it was yellow. It was easy to like see fast and not get like beat up by their dad. And so, <laughs> And so I, I, I spend all of my time looking at behavior. Like at the end of the day, all I do is reverse engineer behavior and that's what, and that's what I figured I, I was good at, right? Like I was good at, because I was such a great salesman, I was able to reverse engineer as I got more mature and older. I'm like, ah, I'm a great salesman because I actually am really paying attention to what you're doing. Like when I took over my dad's liquor store, my, I made a lot of money as a teenager selling baseball cards. All I used to do is stand behind a baseball card table and just people in malls would walk by and look at your case and I would just literally watch their eyes and be like, what are they responding to? So like UI, UX, like my designer friends are always freaked out of how good I am at it because they think I'm a business guy, I shouldn't be good at that but that's all I've ever done my whole life at scale. I feel like I'm doing it right now. I'm like watching what's happening here. And so I use my EQ um, to like do my thing but and, and that's why I'm such a big fan of betting on strengths. I, I think that's the unknown thing about Zucks. I mean, Zucks gets portrayed definitely in the movie and just in general, like, he's got crazy EQ. He like really understands people. Like, I think he's a really smart entrepreneur. Yes, what's your name? How are you? Good. Yeah. 
Yeah, you know, regrets are interesting for me. Like, I'm sure, look, I have a ton of them, right? I pat, if you go, if you go look at my first book, it's called Crush It. In there, I thank my entire family and one random human being, Travis Kalkinick, CEO and co-founder of Uber. And I passed on the angel round in Uber. I literally left $700 million on the table by not investing in my buddy after I just told you, you bet on people and this and that. It happens, right? So I have plenty of things to regret, right? I regret the fact that I, that I, and look, don't cry for me, I'm gonna make $200 million because I gotta get in the next round, but, 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 I regret that when I was doing open cart optimization on winelibrary.com in 1997, that I wasn't smart enough to realize that if I turned that into a product and sold it to Amazon for $500 million, I would've made a fuckload more money than selling 18 more bottles of Pinot Noir, right? So, I, uh, but very honestly, you've got me pegged. I'm basically not capable of really regretting it. I'm trying to answer your question and not be a douchebag about it, but, Regretting feels to me like the opposite of entrepreneurship, right? Like I just think it means looking back and I think speed is the number one variable that most people in this room will struggle with. That is the variable difference that I, that's what Travis and Zucks, Zucks moved, so when Mark bought Instagram for a billion dollars, a couple months earlier I did some Fox program and I said that, I was like, it was December and they're like, hey, make some predictions for 2013. I was like, Facebook's gonna buy Instagram, right? Cool, whatever. Four months later it happens. And CNN asks me to come on because the video went a little viral in the tech community. So I was on Pierce Morgan. And on Pierce Morgan's show, he's, his opening line is, this company's 550 days old. How the hell is it worth a billion dollars? And my opening line is, they stole it. I get out of the studio, I'm hardcore Twitter, so I go on it, and literally there are thousands of tweets of people calling me a fucking idiot. So literally that night, from like 10 o'clock at night to four in the morning, I favorited every single one of those tweets by hand, all of them. (laughs) I think this is a good story because this is what an entrepreneur I think does. I favorited them all and then I guess last year this time, right, uh, Facebook bought WhatsApp for 18 billion and every article like the next day after the news came out is like, oh wait a minute, they fucking stole Instagram and no joke, for a week, my wife and I went to Turks and Caicos for a weekend, right? Luckily she just likes to read and I can't bother her and I laid on a beach for 19 hours a day, two days in a row and replied to every single person that called me an idiot and said, what now, bitch? (laughs) I really think I just wanted to get that in and humble brag but I don't remember why I said that. Oh, why I said it. So Zucks offered three billion for Snapchat. And a lot of people didn't, like, like that seemed insane. But like, I don't think anybody thinks that's insane anymore, right? And so, what he's really smart is he understands the gateway drug is important to him because the 15 year old girl right now in America is not going to be a Facebook user. And so he needs to keep having the next one, right? And luckily he's got the right one right now with Instagram, but every day that Snapchat becomes the next one, he needs to figure that out. Um, But I think he sees it. And so like, it takes that vision. Travis knew that he had to move to every market faster than Lyft, right? And so he just kept raising money if he could and that was the right execution. So I think speed is something that people really need to wrap their head around. Yeah, man. Uh, Alex, Alex, what's up, man? I think every platform is gonna be a media company and so I think it makes a ton of sense. I think everybody in this room is gonna watch like a feature film that's gonna be Facebook only. I think there'll be a number one hit sitcom on Snapchat only. There's, all that matters is the attention graph, right? Where the fuck are our eyes and ears? Where are they, right? And I can tell you right now, if I wanna sell to a 16 year old girl in America, I wanna be in Snapchat, right? So I thought it was a huge coup for the media companies that were launch partners because some of them I think we'd all agree are like <laughs> stodgy and not great and like, and for them this was a little bit of good value. I think it was a really smart move by Snapchat because I really live in this world. A lot of the big advertisers look at them as too young, you only have 13 year olds. So this kind of like grew them up. I think Emily White is a really interesting executive for a lot of people in this room. I think she's super inspirational, boys and girls in this room. Like Emily White, if you don't know her, Google, Facebook, Instagram, and now the COO of Snapchat. I think she's a beast and I think it was a really smart play because it instantly, made them more mature, right? 
Like I've been fucking yelling about Snapchat for like two years. Finally when that happened, I got like 9,000 emails from like old fucking white dudes saying, oh. I was like, yeah, dick. You know, like, like oh. You know, like, like hundreds of millions of people's attention fucking matters. Like, do, you, do I have to, rem- what pisses me off where, you, where you're seeing I'm getting a little pissed is Facebook just went through this. It's not like we're going, like the first time makes sense, right? Like it never happened before, but like Facebook was only college kids. Now it's your fucking grandmother. Like that's what happens. And so like that will continue, like the fastest growth on Instagram right now is 40 to 50 year old women. The fastest growing sector of people taking selfies, fastest growing, so it's a smaller base but it's still volume. Fastest growth of selfies taken on Instagram are 40 to 45 year old women. Like straight up fucking cougar selfies. <laughs> right? Like, and like watch, and again, back to like watching, I'm watching people like have conversations real quick off that reaction, and people are like, yeah, my fucking mom. Like, like people know, you know, like people know what's going on, right? Like, your mom's on Instagram now, 24 months ago, she didn't know what it was. That's just what it is. That's just what's always gonna happen. Because what's happening is we're living through the ageification, like the downward ageification of society. The number one thing I love right now is that the average 42-year-old American woman, in her behavior, the clothes she buys, what she does, how she hangs out with her friends, is acting like the average 29-year-old woman only 10 years ago. Like, nobody wants to be old. I'm 39. Like, I shouldn't be like dressed like, you know what the 39-year-old version of me looked like? 15 years ago, like nobody wants, like nobody wants to get old. Like, it's like it sucks. And there's a flip side to it. Whereas only 10 years ago, a 15-year-old would look up to their 18-year-old sibling and listen to the same music and all that. That's why you're seeing Snapchat and Yik Yak and other things. There's a fragmentation even within generations. Like they want their own fucking thing. And in a much shorter period of time, like it used to be more like seven to 10 years. Now you're like seeing three years is okay. But like after that, like. There's a lot of people in here that like, their high school siblings that are younger than them don't want to fuck with the things that they fuck with. And so it's, it's interesting what's going on with the psychology of generations and people, the youthification of our society. Hey Jackson, thanks so much, this is awesome. Thanks brother. So you talked about kind of how great uh, a time this is to start a company. Yeah. Only failing back, and it was a great question. Only, I want to make sure, like I don't want to stop anybody because they don't want to fail. I just want, I just want to say this. There's a shitload of audacity in the market right now. Like who gives a fuck? I'm going to lose this money over the next three years, but it's going to be good for me because I'm going to have experience. I'm not going to work a dick job. I'm going to do what I want. And, and then I'll figure it out after the fact. I think, it's, I, I think failing's fine. Look, I have a couple people that have failed and I'm going to reinvest in their next idea. I just want to make sure that you're, you think you're ready and you're not just doing it because it's easy money right now. So if you think you're good, like I have a huge fail right now that I can't, I mean, I'm going to invest in this kid the whole way because I've watched him fail, but I've seen all the great things he did. The market and his idea were off a little bit, but he's a fucking assassin. So I just want to, that's, I wanted to clarify and I'm glad you did that because I think you made it better. So, better, Sean? That being said, and like. Shane, sorry. sorry. You said ideas and shit, like whatever. But wait, if, wait to have his back, fucking United class. <laughs> you were 20 years old right now. Yeah. What would you go do? I would do what I did, which was like, not give a fuck about school and start prepping for my life. That, but that's what I did, right? It's not like, I'm not telling you like what is cool to say in a room of kids, I'm telling you what the fuck I did. Like go Google Mount Ida College. Like, 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 <laughs> did you do that? Okay, I thought you did it. So like, you know, like I, I had no other gear, right? So, but I truly feel I was 100% purebred entrepreneur. I truly believe that. And I truly believe that it's probably a high significant chance that nobody in this class is. And that's not bad. I promise you 90% and 85% and 80% can be dramatically more successful than me. I probably could have used a little 10 or 20% of other stuff that would have leveled me out. I was just fucking off the chart. Yeah, man. So you said you came from zero, graduated from Mount Ida College. Yep. Um, was there ever a point where you felt like you had to leverage what you had to do with what you wanted to to survive from making money at an hourly job or doing a startup on the side? Or? My dad had a liquor store, right? Yeah. And so that made it a little bit different. So I think, you know, I came from zero early on, but by the time my, my dad lived the American dream, so 
It'd be a false to see that I did it all by myself. It was a super small business. It was a $3 million revenue business with 10% gross margin. We made 300,000 before expenses. It wasn't a big business. Um, but I knew at 14 that I, could be, that I was way better than my dad. Right, and I was pumped because I was so thankful for what my dad did. Because like we came here and had nothing, and then we had something. Right, so I had this incredible family pride to come in and pay him back. Right, and to walk into a family business that's doing three million, and in 24 months be doing 12 million, and like like I had to buy my own car, like at a garage sale, by the way, and then my brother, who's 11 years younger than me, got a Lexus. Like I'm a little bitter, but. Like, I'm super proud of that part. So I'm not sure, like I have a little bit of a different, like everybody, we all have our different, narr- look, look, I used to be super disrespectful to rich kids, but now that they're all my friends, <laughs> I, I now realize like, fuck, they got it shitty too, right? Like I have a bunch of friends who are like fucking really struggling to try to navigate like that they weren't, that they didn't start on third and a half base and are trying to do it their way. And so like, everybody's got their shit, right? Um, but what I can tell you, what, when I think about entrepreneurship, I couldn't breathe. Like I couldn't breathe. I, all I could ever do was think about what I was gonna sell and what I was like, there was no, I mean like I struggled to even give a fuck about girls like in my late teenage years and in, in early 20s and like that's just natural to like give a fuck, right? And I struggled to like get there because like I actually did better with girls than I deserved to because I literally reverse engineered them because if, they would, they, would realize, like, they would realize that I'd literally rather go to the mall and go to the dollar store and buy something for a dollar and go to a flea market on Saturday and sell it for three than like hang out with them so they liked me more because they were like, what the fuck, right? Like it became, it, be, it actually gave me a good preview to a solid thesis later on but it, it was like that's how raw it was and so that's what I look for. A lot of the people that I'm excited about, them, there's a startup that I'm an investor in called Lawn Starter it's literally a SaaS play for fucking landscapers, right? Um, but like I invested in a second because I'm like, oh, this fucker's like me, right? Like there was just nothing else. It was all blow pops in junior high. It was all like fucking whatever, right? Like whatever. Yeah, man. Seriously? Yeah. Fuck, okay. You're, you're I'll come back. Uh, Johnny. <laughs> What's your name, man? Johnny. Johnny. So as an investor, yeah. I probably, I probably invest 80%, 80% of the time if I'm investing, I fully am bought into the jockey and I believe enough in their horse, right? Like you can show me a hustler that like me and he's like, I'm gonna fucking sell pillows that fucking go in the, like I'm gonna fuck you, right? Like no matter how much I love you, right? Uh, but I'm oftentimes very romanced by the idea but don't believe the kids can execute it. And so it's a mix but I probably, I will, here, so here's my strategy. If I think you've got the chops, I may still write a small check just to get into your ecosystem, double check you, and try to make sure I get on the second, third, and fourth once you mature out and maybe actually have a good idea. So a lot of times, so that's why I'm going, that's why I bet on jockeys because I want to catch them on the next thing, on the next thing, on the next thing. And you know, when somebody writes you that first check, you know, look, some people aren't gonna stay loyal, something could happen, but like, I win that game. I, get, I have good stickiness by like being a good dude and by like betting on someone and so that's a little bit of my strategy for me. 651. Cool, guys thanks so much oh, for wait, having wait, wait, me. Oh, <coughs> well I'm leaving. You're, you're, you gotta head out, I know you got Yeah, I know you got okay. the rest of the we're class. Not, no, oh. But we're not done with oh. you either. This is, I mean, have we ever squeezed 45 minutes <laughs> of oh. stuff you can use for the rest of your life? This has been <laughs> remarkable, really remarkable. Now this, this guy talks a lot of places, you've seen him online, you've seen his what are you talking about? None of these fuckers even know who I was. <laughs> they got to read their emails. <laughs> but because we, we, it's been a while. We've been, we've been wanting to get him here for a couple of years, and one of our common friends sort of <coughs> made the connection that happened. So we don't know when he's going to come back, but I saw everyone writing. I know what you picked up. So let's give him a little bit of something to, to think about. Five years from now, and maybe five minutes from now, what are you not going to forget about this talk that Gary can take with him? You guys ready? Oh, this is cool. Oh. I like this. Get on your strengths and forget about what you suck at. Go all in on your strengths. Don't give a fuck about your weaknesses. Oh my god. I love <laughs> Understand the gateway drug. Mm. Time, execution, and behavior. Ideas are shit, execution is the game. 
Ability to adjust. Go. Speak up. If you want to be an anomaly, you have to act like it. Value of thoughts are extreme. Speed is key. We need to do you. If, if you're itching, start tomorrow. You gotta be hungry. Audit yourself. Audit who you are. Reverse engineer women. <laughs> <laughs> Keep going. I like that Johnny Damon type character in the left corner. Who's over on the other side? Go. Bet on the jockey, not the horse. Go. Ability to adjust. Cougars take selfies. <laughs> Last one, right there. One more. Anyone else? Here you go. Bet on your strengths. Don't give a fuck about your weaknesses. <laughs> nice guys get dick. <laughs> wow. True. I, when you take things out of context, it's like... Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Sick.